Hello and welcome to the second session for IROC, the Introductory Radiation Oncology Curriculum. This is Emma Fields recording from Virginia Commonwealth University. The goal of this session is to walk you through the basics of simulation. The estimated time is about two hours with this overview being fairly short and then some hands-on time actually in your simulation area in your department. The learning objectives are fairly basic, generally to understand the simulation process, to identify common immobilization devices used in your department, to understand the difference between inter and intrafraction target motion, and then to be able to describe what an isocenter is and how it's established. The overview of the simulation process is that the patient is placed in the treatment position. Imaging is obtained, typically a CT scan, and then the intended field is defined, usually based on a scout film where the superior and inferior extent um, is planned out. The patient is marked, um, typically with tattoos, but sometimes with paint pens. And then everything is documented, um, often with photographs. The simulation is tailored to maximize target to avoidance structure ratio. So of course we want to be able to see the target. The patient has to be safe and comfortable and the position also has to be reproducible as we want them to be in the exact same position each time that they come for treatment. The simulation room is where the initial steps of treatment planning are performed. It has features that are similar to the actual treatment vault and features that are different. Of course, instead of actually housing a linear accelerator or other treatment machine, the simulation room holds the device to image the patient, often a CT scanner, an MR, or a PET CT. However, it's similar to the treatment vault in that it contains the same mechanisms for immobilizing the patient and for assessing their position. In front of you, you can see a classic CT simulation room. You can see the table on which the patient lays during the planning process. The table is flat, unlike a curved surface in radiology, which mimics the treatment couch used in the treatment vault. Again, you can have different equipment, um, but it always includes an imaging device. So the first step in simulation is to place the patient in the treatment position. The immobilization is to make sure that we're very precise about how the radiation is delivered. And part of that means minimizing motion, both during treatment and between treatments. So this is the difference between intrafraction, meaning motion during a radiation treatment, and interfraction motion, which is changes in position from day to day. And the simulation process really has to minimize both types of motion. Intrafraction motion, or motion during treatment, can arise from either a patient intentionally or unintentionally moving a body part. For example, turning their head, coughing, sneezing, um, scratching their nose, um, or it can come from normal physiology, such as breathing or their heartbeat when you're treating something in the chest or near the diaphragm, or peristalsis when you're treating something in the abdomen. Interfraction motion is motion between daily treatments. Um, some of these are expected variability in how a patient lays down on the treatment table each day and can be variability in the precision of the radiation therapists to set up the patient in the exact same position for treatment each day. The first case is a 65-year-old male with non-small cell lung cancer and a single brain metastasis, and the plan's already been made to give stereotactic radiosurgery. This is common and can be done in multiple different ways depending on what equipment you have, what machine types you're gonna use. But no matter what, the decisions before CT simulation or treatment planning remain the same. So you're gonna to wanna to think about what type of immobilization devices you're gonna need. If you're doing a frameless type of stereotactic radiosurgery, you're gonna to wanna to think about the type of mask. For example, this mask shown in the picture um, is one that 
has several pieces that you're going to want to describe to the patient and all together it takes quite a long time to dry so you have to make sure that your patient is able to tolerate laying in that position for that amount of time um, and that they're okay sort of feeling closed in. Other simulation aids you're going to want to think about is whether you're going to need to add those brain lab spheres if you're using um, the exact track system as you can see here the little um, spheres on the outside of the mask. Maybe you want to use IV contrast. Some people like to use that to help with image fusion with a diagnostic MRI. And then you're going to also want to think about the positioning of the patient. How can they tolerate laying supine versus prone? I think most people say supine is much better for this, much more stable. Arms up, down, or on the chest. Do you need the head turned, extended, or flexed? And then you're gonna to wanna to give some directions to the sim therapists on the length of scan, which is typically given with a bony anatomy landmark, such as from the vertex of the skull down through, let's say, the thoracic inlet, or even the base of skull if you need a shorter scan. The next case is um, another relatively common case, a 54-year-old male with a locally advanced squamous cell carcinoma at the base of tongue. Again, you're gonna wanna think about some of the immobilization devices that you might need prior to getting your patient to CT simulation. So for head and neck cancers, we're also thinking about what kind of mask to use. Um, and again, there are multiple options, and these are gonna vary based on what your attendings like to use and what you have available to you. Um, in the next picture, I'll show you an example of a mask um, as well as a headrest. Um, and then there are different types of mouthpieces and bite blocks that can be used. Some people like to use shoulder pulls, um, basically to sort of bring the shoulders down away from the neck. And then other sim aids, again, IV contrast, particularly if you're going to be treating lymph nodes. Um, and of course, you have to think about whether your specific patient can tolerate IV contrast. Um, maybe you want to add some wire markers on palpable nodes. Um, you also might want to think about adding wire markers if somebody has had a surgery, um, marking any incisions. Again, positioning, maybe you want to turn the head and giving some clear directions on the length of the scan you would like to, to have. So here's an example of a CT simulation for a head and neck cancer patient. Um, so you can see in the picture on the right, this is a long mask. Um, we call it an S-frame. It covers the entire head, neck, and the upper shoulders. Um, you can see the head is resting on a TMO or a headrest. Um, the chin is um, extended away from the neck to try and minimize dose going through the mouth. And then you can also see in the picture on the left a custom mouth block. Um, here's one made from sort of the tip of a, a syringe. Um, but the mouthpiece can help protect parts of the oral cavity not being treated. Here's some example of some standard breast setups. On the left, you see a supine breast board. Um, with a little bit of an angle to it, as well as some arm holders behind it. And then below that, you can see an example of a supine tangent breast setup. On the right, you can see a prone breast board. There's many different manufacturers and styles. Um, the affected breast sort of hangs through that cutout um, and heads down towards the table. So one thing to consider for the prone setup, at least with this prone breastboard is the woman can be quite elevated off of the floor, so you have to make sure that she's stable. Um, but you can see that with the prone setup, especially for women with larger breasts, it does pull the tissue sort of away from the chest wall and can be a benefit in our setup, again, for maximizing that ratio um, of target to avoidance structure. All right, our fourth case, moving down into the pelvis. This is a 49-year-old female with a locally advanced rectal cancer, and her plan is for pre-op pelvic radiotherapy. Um, so again, lots of decisions here, um, how you want to immobilize, whether you want to use a belly board and sim prone, 
or whether you want to use a supine setup, maybe use a vaclock bag to immobilize parts of the upper body or to mobilize the hips or further down and mobilize the lower legs. Lots of sim aids to consider. Um, rectal contrast is something that I use quite frequently in my patients. Um, typically I'll use a red rubber tube and inject 10 to 15 cc's um, just to line the rectum which can help visualize exactly where that apple core tumor is. Um, placing a BB or some sort of metallic marker on the anus can also be incredibly helpful. Um, whether you're trying to define where the anus is to include it in your target or whether you're trying to remind yourself where it is to avoid it um, because that can add quite a lot of toxicity. It's very helpful to mark as it's a difficult thing to actually find that transition on your CT imaging. Um, often we instruct our patients to have a full bladder and I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides why that might be important. And then positioning again, um, one thing to consider is whether your patient has had to have a diverting ostomy, and in which case some patients really prefer not to lay on their stomach, um, although prone often does have quite a few benefits, which I'll also show you. So here's just an example of why you might want to do prone in some situations versus supine. The whole idea is if you have a belly board, it can have a cutout um, where the abdomen can actually fall forward and the intestines, particularly that small bowel contoured there in cyan, can move out of the pelvis and fall forward away from where your beams are going to be treating the posterior pelvis. Of course, sometimes this isn't quite as comfortable for patients and it can be a little bit more challenging for the therapist to set up on a daily basis. So if you're trying to do something a bit more precise, um, a bit more technically challenging, sometimes supine is your more stable option. We talked a bit about full bladder versus empty bladder. This is a very dramatic example. You can see um, the bladder is contoured in yellow and then the pictures on the left, both the sagittal and the axial, the bladder is super full. Um, and then on the pictures on the right, the patient has um, used the bathroom and what falls into the place is all the intestines. So instructing your patient to come to SIM and then subsequent treatments with a full bladder will allow the intestines hopefully to be pushed up out of the pelvis and can significantly decrease both acute and late toxicity. Other simulation aids, um, here I'm showing you pictures of an anal BB um, in the upper left. An example of that rectal contrast I talked about in the bottom left. Oral contrast, which I don't use quite as frequently, but some places do. Um, patients typically really dislike it, um, but for upper GI, sometimes it can be helpful just to swallow a small amount. And then, of course, IV contrast, which we're all familiar with in the bottom right, which can be really helpful for delineating nodal basins. In this last case, we're going to highlight the issue of intrafraction motion management. This is a 60-year-old male with a stage 4A colon cancer with a single lung lesion who's been referred for SBRT. Obviously, whenever we're talking about stereotactic treatments, reproducibility is key and the patient must be comfortable. So the same decisions before CT simulation apply, looking at your immobilization devices, what you have available to you, um, and what is the most sort of rigid and comfortable reproducible setup. Next, we're going to talk about the options for intrafraction motion management. We've, we're going to talk about um, taking a 4D CT, what exactly that means, tumor tracking, gating, and then breathing inhibition. A 4D CT adds the dimension of time to a regular CT and allows for images to be acquired at each phase in the breathing cycle. Once all the images are acquired, they are linked and can be viewed as a video so that the tumor can be seen in all physiologic states as opposed to a snapshot only with a standard 3D CT. And here's an example of what that would look like. So here you can see the tumor sort of moving almost in a little circle um, on the sagittal image in the upper right, 
um, and then sort of coming in and out of view um, in the axial on the left. And here you're making sure that you're gonna be capturing that tumor in all of those phases of breathing. So you're really taking into account that intrafraction motion. Another option for managing intrafraction motion is tumor tracking, which is imaging that is used to track the tumor motion during treatment delivery. This often requires placement of an internal fiducial marker. And some of the examples of this are CyberKnife, which you can see on the left, a robotic arm basically tracking a marker within a tumor and treating the entire time that the tumor is moving. Another example are Calypso markers that are placed inside of a prostate um, here on the right and can be used to tell the machine where the prostate is at all parts, at all points in the treatment delivery time. Um, Align RT is another system that uses surface imaging um, and can be used to do the same thing. Respiratory gating is similar to tracking but the beam is only on when the tumor is in a specific location. Um, so you can see um, in part A, the beam is off as the tumor has moved out of the respiratory phase where it's gonna align. And then as the patient breathes out, the beam comes on and that continues throughout the cycle. Um, this is a non-invasive method, does not require a fiducial marker to be placed, um, but it does require extensive monitoring um, to allow it to be done accurately. And of course, does increase treatment time because you're only treating in certain phases of the um, breath cycle. Similarly, active breathing control requires continuous monitoring of lung volume and only treats at certain phases of the breathing cycle. However, this is complete inhibition of the breathing. So when the lung volume is at an ideal level, the beam is turned on while the patient holds their breath from somewhere between 12 and 20 seconds. An advantage is that you can get very reproducible breath holds um, and allows for a much smaller tumor margin, as you can imagine, compared to that 4D technique. However, disadvantages are this is a lot more invasive for the patient. Um, as you can see in the picture, they have to have um, a mouthpiece as well as a nose plug. I tell my patients it's much like going snorkeling or scuba diving, and it requires a longer treatment time because there's recovery time built in in between the breath holds. Abdominal compression is another perhaps more gentle type of breathing inhibition, and there are several different systems and belts that can be used to do that. Often it's just sort of a reminder for patients not to take a big belly breath um, while they're in their treatment position. Okay, those are the cases we're gonna talk about. Um, next, we're gonna go through what happens once the patient is set up and immobilized. So obviously the next step is to obtain imaging for the treatment planning. Most commonly, this is a CT scan. You can see here the patient has um, little BBs marked, um, which is representative of where the isocenter will likely be. It's important to set your scan range and be generous on this because it's awfully annoying having to bring the patient back if you decide you need just a little bit more um, visualization. The next part again is to mark the intended field. The isocenter by definition is the point in three-dimensional space through which the central rays of the radiation beams pass. So it's essentially you're telling the machine where the center of the patient is. It's usually established by the physician at the time of simulation to facilitate the next steps of treatment planning. But sometimes there can be standard isocenters that are set based on which part of the body you're using. Ideally, you want this to be in a stable body part, um, something that can be um, reproduced and found each time of treatment. So one option is to place it in the center of the tumor. Um, for simple treatment plans, it can be placed um, even just at mid-plane, um, but provided it's somewhere close and then you're not making huge shifts um, between your planning and treatment setup. And of course, the final step we talked about is marking the patient and documenting. So frequently patients are marked with permanent tattoos to aid with reproducibility of the setup and these are used to align with the laser lights that are in the walls of the treatment rooms. 
There are other options. Sometimes patients refuse to get tattoos or their skin will not show the marks. Um, there are paint pens with stickers to hold them on, um, and even a line RT or surface imaging can be used in place. Tattoos should be placed on easily accessible and stable anatomic locations. And then multiple tattoos are used to ensure minimization of changes in position in three dimensions, so our standard vertical, longitudinal, and lateral, as well as with regard to um, pitch, roll, and yaw, which are demonstrated here. We're gonna go through these in more detail in session six on patient setup and verification. And of course, we're gonna document everything that we've done so that it can be reproduced each time the patient arrives. This is an example of SIM documentation, so photographs taken of the patient in their positioning, and then lots of notes made by the therapist. More documentation. Next, I hope that you'll take some time to go into the simulation room and go through the scavenger hunt to identify the CT scanner or other imaging system, the table controls, as well as the computer system. I hope you'll be able to go through some of the cases we discussed, including how you would immobilize a brain stereotactic patient, a head and neck patient, a breast cancer patient, pelvis, as well as a lung stereotactic treatment patient. I hope you'll talk about how you could set the ISO center, identify the lasers and see how they're used. Also look at BBs used by the therapist to mark the ISO center and see the ink used for marking tattoos. Extra credit if you're able to identify and use some of the simulation aids, um, including the power injector or contrast delivery system. Um, look for the PO contrast, BBs, wire markers, rings to hold if those are used, sponge or pads for under the knees, and ask your therapists if there's other commonly used items in your department. Being a resident is the best time to find this out. So I hope you'll take advantage of it. Thanks for your time. This concludes IROC session two.